specifically looking at old homes and trying to kind of you know uncover the stories of of their their past over the last two to three years and there are a lot of um, just incredible old homes around us um, and, and tonight what I wanted to do was focus in the Barnesville, Comus, and Dickerson areas because there are actually a number of homes um, in that area that I think um, when I talk about them or when I bring them up when I'm talking to people I get what is one of my favorite responses um, which is people saying, I didn't even know that was, that was, I never even knew that house. Um, so I, I'm hoping that the homes you're going to see tonight um, are, I, I, and I'm confident they will be homes that you've not seen before or recognized. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to dive into it. It sounds like there's some feedback there. Um, okay. So, one of the things that I always frequently talk about in the importance of highlighting these, these old houses is this idea that as I continue to dig into to homes, what I'm realizing is for the most part, stories of people and events and places from the ag reserves past are largely kind of contained within these old homes. Um, they almost kind of serve as this container for these stories and almost a, a chain of custody passing down from one homeowner to the next kind of the the events of what has taken place at that property over time and so when we when we lose old homes in many cases we're not just losing the wood and the bricks and and whatever we're also losing a whole lot of stories right and so this is why i think it's very important that we um, continue to highlight these homes and also preserve them and protect them um, and what I think is fun about these homes tonight that I'm about to talk about is that when you come across an old home that you didn't even know existed, it, it kind of presents you this new piece to a puzzle that, that you didn't even realize you needed, right? And it, and it all of a sudden unlocks and kind of reveals more stories about people and places and things um, that taken kind of together start to add up and you, you, you know, you kind of get one degree better sense of the context for where we are today and, and how we got here. Um, so, so these homes are all ones, like I said, that are a, a little bit off the beaten path. Um, you know, a couple of them are close to roads, but many of them sit way back off of the roads. Um, I'll tell you, right up front, I have actually never been inside any of these homes tonight. And I don't normally talk about homes that I haven't been inside of, but I think that they're all very interesting. Um, and I am actively working to get to them. It's just with COVID and everything is a little difficult. Uh, but you can see here on the map, if you look in this, just to orient you here, if you look in the center towards the bottom, you'll see Bellsville, right? And so then we have Barnesville kind of up in the center right. Dickerson to the left of that, and then Comus is kind of up towards the top of the map, right? So that's kind of the area we're in, you know, butting right up against the, the Frederick County line um, along the Minoxi River. So I wanted to start tonight talking about uh, Mount Ephraim. And this is a home, this, this home is right on the road. I mean, it's almost literally right on the road. Um, but it is one of those homes that's um, easy to miss. It's on the, the road name that it sits on is Mount Ephraim. And it's actually at the intersection of Mount Ephraim and Harris Roads. And what I love about that is the individual who built this home in 1868 was Ephraim Harris. So his home literally sits at the intersection of his two names. I'm sure that's not a coincidence. Um, he, the, the, this location, it's, it's kind of a, a T intersection. Um, go back, it's kind of right up here in the top center, right on the Frederick County line, but it's this T intersection between Mount Ephraim and, uh, and Harris Roads. And in the 1860s, he ran a really successful uh, kind of market here at this intersection. Um, and there was, there was a bunch of, there was a stable here, there was a blacksmith shop. So there was, there was kind of a, a, a grouping of, of different facilities and structures um, that were in operation throughout the Civil War. And at the conclusion of the war, he had made 
significant amounts of money at this market. And he decided to, to build this, this house, which is, I think, simplistic in plan, but, but somewhat grand just in, in the brick structure. Um, and if you look at it from the back, you can see it's, it's kind of got this pretty neat L-shaped um, uh, architecture to it. The, uh, the front of the home there in the top center, there used to be a, a porch on the home. The home was restored in the 1940s, and a lot of the initial Victorian uh, architectural features were lost in that, in that restoration. Um, but that's why you see kind of that weirdly shaped door slash window above the, the front door on the second floor there. Um, so that, that would have walked out on onto a porch. Um, so Ephraim Harris, he's, he's running this, this market. He builds the home in the 1860s. He actually also set up a, what the records say are a restaurant next to his home that he ran through the late 1800s. Although there's, there's kind of a funny note in the historical um, records of somebody who went through and was looking at this. And there was an inventory from this restaurant in the 1880s, I believe. And the only real item on this inventory list was 177 gallons of whiskey. So um, the, the historical note was maybe it wasn't so much a restaurant as much as a kind of a saloon. Um, but, but nonetheless, it sounds like it was probably a pretty fun place. Uh, home was actually for sale and sold just a couple of years ago. That's why I have get, they got this interior picture of, of the stairwell there. Um, it's still beautiful on the inside from the pictures I've seen, although it has been a little bit chopped up and moved around from its initial structure. So it's not exactly um, original on the, on the inside, but still maintains a lot of um, interesting, um, you know, historic charm. And I would just say, you know, that the Harris family is, and we're going to see that name a couple of times. I mean, they, they were big in this area um, of, of the Comus area, right? This was a, a well-to-do family. Um, as we've seen, you know, when I'm talking about properties around Poolswell, we're always talking about the Chiswells and the Whites and the Pools. Um, up in this area, we're going to be talking about the Harrises and the Hayes and the Pierres and the Selmans, right? It's, it's a similar, you know, you've got one family that comes in really, really early in the late 1700s normally, and then they have a bunch of children. Most of them stay relatively local and they build these, you know, these homes. Um, and as a result, we've got kind of these homes that are all kind of tied to these few family names in the area. This is the, the Lewis Selman house. So this house is really interesting to me. And, and if anybody happens to know the owners or much more about this, I would, I would be all ears. Um, but it's, it sits way back on the back of a driveway. Um, I've never actually even seen it in person. Uh, I know it's there just from records and aerial pictures from the 70s. Um, but uh, built by Lewis, or excuse me, actually built by William Selman um, in the late 1870s. And he gave the land and, and this home or a home that sat in this spot before this um, to his son, Lewis. The, the Selman family was a well-to-do family in, in the Barnesville, Comus area. Um, they were involved in politics, and they are, later on actually were involved in a lot of house building in the area. You'll actually see the Selman name attached to a bunch of homes um, around the Poolsville area as well. Um, but this home, I just think, is it's a really unique looking house. Um, there are a couple that are similar to it in in like the downtown part of Barnesville. Um, but but some interesting features here. Louis Selman never married, never had children. He, he lived his life here at this farm, uh, died in his early 50s, unfortunately, pretty, pretty early uh, in life. Um, but as a result, uh, you know, there's not, there's not a ton of stories coming out of this place because a lot of times what we see is, uh, are those stories kind of passed down through offspring. Um, the home stayed in the Selman family for, for a while, but by the early 1900s, it's my understanding that actually passed on to another family. This is, um, I mentioned the overhead shot. So I'm, I'm sure I've showed it before, but there is this amazing website, um, Aerial Vintage, where in the 1970s, they flew a bunch of planes out of the Frederick Airport and they flew all over this area and just took a ton of black and white photos from the air. Um, 
which, you know, I guess at the time was kind of a, you know, a fairly original concept and they were trying to, uh, I would assume, sell these photos to homeowners. Um, but they've preserved them on this site and you can see them all for free. The only annoying thing is you have this like watermark that I just can't get rid of. But, um, but it's really great to be able to go back and, and see what these homes looked like in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, and in many cases, they haven't changed much, but it's also helped me get a sense of kind of how they're positioned, what outbuildings were associated with them. You know, as you can see here, the barns, there's a spring house here. Um, but also, and I'll talk about this in a minute, there's been homes where I didn't even know that they existed and they no longer exist, but because these pictures were taken in the seventies, they've been enough of kind of a breadcrumb to help me go back and, and find what they were and, you know, what the story is behind them. So here's another, another Selman property. This is the Selman farm. This was built for William Selman and William Selman actually, um, came to this area, I believe in the 1820s. Um, he was a veteran of the War of 1812, came here around 1826, uh, built the, the initial portion of this home, right? So th this, this house, you can see, you know, I say it's built in the 1820s. It's really, as is the case with a lot of old homes around here, there's kind of an initial relatively simple architectural layout that was built and then over you know a century or two kind of expanded upon um, and that's what you see here in this home um, but uh, William Selman actually passed this home to his son Gassaway and in the 1840s and 1850s this was an incredibly prosperous farm um, it owns over 600 acres it had an orchard it had it was growing all different kinds of crops uh, lots of enslaved labor here um, and they had a, a really beautiful uh, big stone barn, which is, is really um, interesting. Um, and unfortunately, you can see the barn in the 70s was in kind of this state of disrepair. And um, actually, you can, you can drive past this home today. And um, it's, it's really, if you're, if you're driving to the Monoxy Aqueduct, so if you're going down Mouth of Monoxy Road towards the aqueduct, it's, it's right there on your left. You'll see the house. And when you pass the house, if you kind of look back into the woods, you can see the, the ruins of this barn um, that are still there. And it's a, it's a really cool looking barn. It looks like it, it had kind of an interesting design to it. Um, but one of the interesting stories here is, you know, this location so close to uh, the Binoxy River, so close to the aqueduct, um, which was a, a spot that the Confederates, at least on one occasion, did actually try to blow up and destroy. Um, this was important ground for, for the Union to hold. Um, and there were points of time during the Civil War where Union soldiers actually camped out on, on William Selman's farm here, right? So, um, you know, not only a kind of a cool house, but a property with an interesting backstory. Okay, so this, this home, unfortunately, no longer exists. This one is gone. Um, so it's, you know, it's another one of those examples that I like to point to as, um, you know, just kind of an unfortunate sign of, you know, things getting lost through time. And I actually, I'm going to jump to the next slide to start it, because if you see this, this aerial vintage shot there in black and white, I was going, like about three weeks ago, I was going through some of these pictures in this area because that's how I spend my time these days. I don't know why. Um, but I noticed in the, I, I've gotten good at looking at these pictures, right? So I noticed in the bottom right, and you can kind of see, I put it in a red box, what looks like a cemetery, which got me kind of interested because given the area where this is, there was only one cemetery that I was aware of. This is kind of off of, um, this is off of Comus Road. It's kind of near Sugarloaf Mountain. There's a cemetery out there. It's the Pierre Family Cemetery. I've talked about it before. And it's a, it's a really cool little family plot. It's off of like a road now. It's very much, um, well, I don't know if the, the cemetery itself is public, but it's right off of a public road. It's very easy to get out and it's really a peaceful, nice setting. Um, but so my, my thought was like, well, 
it can't be it can't be that cemetery because there's no house next to that cemetery. Um, but then when I started digging, I found out, oh no, it is that cemetery. It's just the house is completely gone. And I mean, there's there's no trace of this house. It's like completely gone, um, which is you know just a sign of how quickly things go away, right? I mean, this picture was taken in the early '70s, um, so 50 years later, and it's there's not a trace. And the story with this is relates to the PR family or the Pierre family. And they, sorry, I'm going the wrong direction. So the, the Pierre's came from France, it's a French family. And uh, they came to the area in the early 1700s. So this, this was actually one of the earliest farmsteads in this part of the Ag Reserve. Um, Alexander Pierre was, was one of the, the, you know, the initial Pierre family members to the area. He built what was described as a very simple structure that, you know, as is the case with the, with the prior home was added onto over the years, hence why the, the house kind of, you know, you look at this house, it's clearly not a 1780s house. That's not how houses looked when they were built in the 1780s. But so this started as a relatively simple, probably log dwelling, um, with you know one room deep two rooms on each side you know two floors and then over the years the pierre family kind of expanded this built onto it and it kind of took on this larger square shape um so the home was there it it stayed in the pierre family for i believe right around 100 years and then it was passed on through a couple of families and in the 1970s a company actually came in, purchased this land and, and the home. Um, and that, that's when I believe it was taken down. Um, and their intent actually was to build a golf course. And I, I'm not sure what happened. There is no golf course here. Um, there, is a, there is a small neighborhood. It's, um, I think it's Briarly Hall. Bri it's Briarly something out there. But um, really large homes on kind of a, a relatively straight road that ends right at the Pierre family cemetery. Um, so there were some homes built here, but, you know, given the possibilities and given what we've seen at some other locations, I'm pretty pleased with, with the outcome here. Unfortunately, we, we lost this really cool house kind of in that process. As you can see, I mean, it was in, it, it appears in the early seventies, like it was in pretty bad shape. So I, I'm not sure that there was much that could be done anyway. And then right across the street from, from Alexander Pierre's farm is the James Pierre farm. James was the grandson of Alexander. He built this home, uh, I, I believe actually in 1857, right before um, the Civil War kicked off. And again, um, you know, we see these family names over and over again. So, so the Pierre's here built this home. It was a, a very successful farmstead. Um, it, of, it's, a, it's a very simplistic looking home from the front, but it takes on kind of a more grand uh, nature when you turn it to the side. It's a lot of that in the back there is obviously addition. I don't think they had these big glass windows in the 1860s. Um, but you can see the, that double chimney feature there, which is really, really unique. We, we have that on a couple of old houses in the area, but they're mostly really small houses. Um, Think about like the John Poole house, for example, here in town. If you actually look at it the next time you're maybe at Locals, it's got double chimneys kind of like this. Uh, but this home is much, much bigger. Um, so it, it just kind of denotes a, a certain level of, of wealth that was taking place uh, on this property and within the Pierre family. The, uh, the Farr family owned this, this property in, I believe, in the 1960s. And they put, I think, most, if not all of this land under some kind of environmental protection, which is awesome. Um, so, the, so the land is protected. And I know I've, I've heard people in the Comus area, actually, when I bring up this farm, they'll say, oh, you mean the Far Mansion. And so sometimes I'll hear Far Mansion um, referred to, as, and that's the same property as this, this James Pierre farm. Okay, so, and then another example of the, uh, the Harris family coming into play. If you follow my uh, old homes page on Facebook, you'll notice that I just changed my um, background picture to that picture on the right, that kind of side profile, just because I think it's so, um, 
just such a cool kind of stereotypical <laughs> old house black and white photo. Uh, but the Harris Harris Farmhouse, um, no surprise, located off of Harris Farm. Um, it, th this this house is um, way way set back. You can't see it from the road. Yeah, but it's boring. it is it is located really close to um, the lavender farm. If you know where that is, the I think it's Soliato Lavender Farm out there. Um, also really close to that, that first house I talked about built by Ephraim Harris. Um, so th this, this place is, is interesting. There's actually two homes on this property. Uh, there are, there's an old log home. Um, and then there is a, sorry, I'm just looking at comments. Um, so there's a, there's an, actually an, an old, log structure on the property that looks like it was probably built in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And then there's this home, which um, was built and then added on to over the time, but started in the 1820s um, by the Harris family. And that's that's somewhat typical. We've seen that. I've shown you some other homes. Um, the Solomon Simpson Plantation near Bellsville is a really good example where you've got uh, an old kind of log structure built in the late 1700s, and then actually an 1800s home, in, in that case, literally attached to it, um, giving it kind of a unique look. Um, but this home has, you know, been kind of added onto, you can see in that upper right picture that as we go further back on the house, we have newer and newer additions. So that the front portion of that home with, with the double porches, which is a really kind of cool and unique look. I don't, I can't think of any other homes in the area that I think look similar to that. And you can see the detail on the porch work there. Um, but so just kind of a really interesting structure. I don't unfortunately have a ton of stories about this one. Um, the, the, the records are a little bit scant. Uh, I am as of yesterday in touch or have contact information for the owners. So I'm hoping to talk to them about it shortly. Um, but, um, but just another example of like a really cool house that I think is, is one that I would assume most have not seen or, or heard of before, just because it is so far back there, kind of off the beaten path. Okay, so the Frederick Hayes farm, this one, um, you might recognize this one because it is, it's, it's right outside of Barnesville, um, off of, I guess that's Barnesville Road that runs through there. Um, kind of near where, where Barnesville Road and um, I think it's West Old Baltimore intersect. This is built by the Hayes family. Again, we see the Hayes family coming up. The Hayes family were really some of the original settlers of Barnesville. Um, even though Barnesville was named after an individual with the last name of Barnes, my understanding is he stuck around a town for a while after the name, town was named for him. It was actually named Barnes Town first and then it changed to Barnesville. But he uh, he moved out of the area, um, and and the Hayes the Hayes has stayed around. So in many cases, you might want to uh, petition to rename Barnesville to Hayesville. But um, so the Hayes family very very prominent in the area, um, similar to uh, the Pierres and the Harrises and the Selmans. Um, Frederick Hayes built this farm in in the 1860s. It's a pretty, I, I think from the front, we see a lot of farm homes like this with kind of that central gable. Um, and, and so fairly standard there. This is another case where from the side, it looks, it takes on a little bit of a different shape. The, um, that, that bottom left picture there where you've got kind of that very odd two story porch roof thing happening, which is kind of unique. What's funny about that is the only other places that I've seen that locally are actually right in Barnesville. There's a couple of other homes that have kind of a similar, really high elevated um, ceiling above a, um, a porch. And my strong suspicion is that probably that's because it was the same individual coming around and, and doing that, which is something we see a lot, right? We'll see when we go inside houses, we'll see very similar mantle work on homes around the area or, you know, the same kind of um, design on on the, um, the the stairs and the hand railings and whatnot. And basically what was happening was as homes were built or as they were refurbished over the years, you had an individual who kind of had an expertise in, in one thing or another and would come around and hit a bunch of homes at once. And you'd kind of do it all the same. 
um, at each of these homes. And so as a result, you'd see these connections between these places. What, what's kind of an interesting mystery here, I don't know if Glenn is here or not tonight, we were talking earlier today. If you look at um, the, the Hayes family in Barnesville actually had a, a good bit of intermarriage with the Poole family. Um, and I think I saw Jim Poole on here too, so feel free to correct me on this, Jim. But um, in, in the, the records on Find a Grave for John Poole, who Poole's was named after, it indicates that when he died in the early 1800s, he was initially buried on the Frederick Hayes farm. And then he was reinterred at Monoxy Cemetery around 1917. And I'm trying to figure out which, you know, like where that location was. There is a, a Hayes family cemetery that's kind of down, if you know where St. Mary's is, it's kind of across the street from there and set back um, in some, some farmland. It's a really, really pretty little um, family plot. Um, maybe it's that, Glenn didn't seem to think it was that. Um, he, he thought maybe there, there was also a pool cemetery um, if you know where Brightwell Crossing is, right in the middle of Brightwell, if you've ever kind of walked around that neighborhood, there's this big, huge kind of, it's more than a mound, it's almost this, this elevated portion right in the center, center of the neighborhood. Walk up there sometime, and there is one gravestone that's lying flat there, um, but there were members of the Poole family buried there as well. So it's, it's possible that the, the record is, is mislabeled, and that's where John Poole was initially buried. Um, so a little bit of a mystery there, but um, if anybody happens to have further details, I'm, I'm interested to hear what you know on that as well. I mean, and it's also possible maybe there was some kind of plot on this. This is the Frederick Hayes farm, so maybe there was something here, um, but there doesn't seem to be any signs of it today. And this is the, the Richard Hayes house. Um, this is one... I think this house is really, really cool. Uh, I mean, it looks really unique. It's kind of got, it's it's brick, but it's got the, these Italianate features with kind of the curved windows. Um, and what's what's interesting here, so so this, this home is right in, I hate saying downtown because it sounds silly, but it's in the in the central area where all the homes are clustered together in Dickerson. Um, right next to the railroad tracks, kind of tucked back in there. And it's really kind of, you can kind of get a glimpse of it from the road. It's not that far off the road, but there's just a ton of trees and growth in front of it. So it's very hard to see. You have to kind of know what you're looking for. Um, but, but a really, really cool home. So built by Richard Hayes. Uh, Richard Hayes also um, had linkages to the pool. I think he's Richard Poole Hayes. Uh, he fought in uh, the Civil War for the Confederacy after the war, uh, was married, built this home here in Dickerson, and was, by all accounts, a, a successful uh, farmer and merchant. Um, he, he also was uh, apparently kind of one of the leading drivers of establishing um, the, the Daughters of the Confederacy um, kind of organization in this area, or at least the, the chapter of it in this area. Um, so he appears to be someone who, you know, um, following the war very much uh, believed it important to continue to kind of highlight the contributions um, from, well, I, highlight the, the, the impact of the war. We'll leave it at that. I'm, I'm not sure, you know, uh, clearly he fought for the Confederacy, what his feelings were after the war. Um, but, um, but kind of an interesting past there for sure. Um, it's just always interesting to me to think about just the stories that would have been told um, in a house like this, given kind of the past um, of, of, of the people who lived here. And yeah, these, I know these pictures are kind of hard to see. Um, they're from like the 1980s and the exposure is a bit weird, but you can just see kind of really cool features here. Um, especially with kind of those keystone arches above the windows, kind of a, a, a cool cool touch that I, I'm not really sure there's any homes that come to mind for me in this area that look similar to this. There's some that are kind of boxy and angular like this, but not, not with these kind of Italianate features like that. Okay, so I talked for like 30 or 40 minutes. So um, 
how about some questions? And feel free to unmute at this time if you'd like to ask any questions or send them in the chat. Hey, Kenny, this is Jack. How are you? Hey, how's it going? Doing well. I was, as you were doing the talk, I was going through the um, 1879 County Atlas for Medley District. Yep. And just, just about every, every one of the families, uh, the residences, the uh, residents show up uh, in the Atlas. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. It is always kind of neat when you see that. Um, yeah. I mean, these, yeah. These, these homes are cool because they were largely built, or a bunch of them were built in the, um, you know, around that time frame when those maps were starting to come out. So yeah, so it's kind of neat to be able to see them right there um, in front of you. Kenny, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, that uh, Efren Harris house there, a foot of Strickoff Mountain. Yeah. There's an old story with that, that, uh, during the war, uh, he had himself a portable still mounted on a wagon and he was selling liquor to the soldiers. That's how he got the money to build his house. <laughs> well, that that makes sense. I guess that accounts for the uh, 177 gallons in, in his so-called restaurant. Um, hmm, interesting. I could, I could see him being a pretty popular guy with soldiers coming through the area if he was selling that. So that, that makes a lot of sense. What year was the Italianate house built? I, I don't recall. That last one? Yeah. Uh, I think it was 18, let's see, 18. So this one is 1883. So it's, you know, this is, um, it's a bit late in the Italianate period. Like a lot of the Italianate ones we see are like 1860s, 1870s. Um, I think like Rocklands is a good example, built in 1870. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but yeah. The um, Kitlands Mansion is Italianate and it was built closer to 1900. Mm. And, and they have a caretaker's cottage, which is for sale at the moment. Um, mm. And it is also Italianate. Uh, and you, you're right, absolutely. You don't see that much of that um, around. So I just thought that was an interest. I, they may be completely unrelated, but there's not a lot of them, so. Yeah, yeah, you don't see too much. Most of the Italianate architecture stuff is more kind of in urban type environments. You don't see a ton of it here. There are there are a couple of really, really good ones that I was just looking at recently. Um, if you're driving up to Frederick, like mm -hmm. right before you get to um, uh, that old town, there, there, on that, like there's like that straight path out there um, that that has a bunch that are kind of sitting off in the distance um so there's a there's a bunch up there that are kind of cool but um but in the ag reserve there aren't too many at least on this kind of western portion of the ag reserve there's not much cool hey kenny um my name is uh steve Sohair, and i'm i'm curious um i haven't attended any of these before and this is great i really appreciate you sure. sharing all your knowledge is there some way that when you go to these houses or research them um like that helps you pinpoint the the time frame i mean i guess there's a lot of things in there but are there a few key things you can share when you when you see a house how you kind of date it to a certain era or period yeah so i i so for, first of all full disclosure like i'm i am mostly figuring out kind of once once i know where a house is located i have enough kind of tools online to find the historic records which tell me the date right so like in this like this one that's on the screen like 1883 is not my guess i know that for a fact because it's in the records um that said like i think the the easiest way to to do that and um i i can send it out later but there's like there are periods of time where like so italianate architecture for example so like looking at this house um on the screen like i would know immediately that this is going to be late 1800s because that's just kind of when those arch windows and things were done right they didn't they didn't do that in the early um 
in the early part of the 1800s or earlier than that. And, and that kind of style largely went out of favor kind of in the late 1800s. And we went, we go to more kind of Victorian looking, looking things. So like, I've looked at enough houses to kind of have a sense of like, this is probably built somewhere around here based on a lot of it is kind of artwork, the materials, kind of the, the, the level of like intricacy of the design, right? I mean, obviously your earliest houses are going to be really, really simplistic. Um, and, and honestly, like the earliest houses that were built of wood in the late 1700s, like they just, they're just not around anymore because there's to a certain extent that a house built like that can only stick around for so long. So what we're left with is our homes that were built um, with by people who had more wealth than, than most. Right. And so I, I would say, I think it's important to note, we do sometimes get this, I think, skewed sense of the past when we only look at homes that are still with us because think about Think about in the in the 1870s, all of these, um, you know, African American communities springing up from formerly enslaved and building these homes. They didn't have the financial means to build these large brick structures, so they built what they could, which were largely wood structures. Well, those those are all long gone for the most part, right? I mean, there's there's still a few remaining, but for the most part, they're gone. But as a result, when we look at the landscape today, those things are missing, right? So the other piece of not only dating a oh, home is, is also moved. Yeah, it's also just kind of keeping in mind that like when I'm going through these homes, I'm I'm telling the story of essentially wealthy white families because those were the ones who had the means to build homes that could stick around for 200 years. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Yep. I have a question from the chat and I'll also point out um, just on Kenny's last point, we do have stories about some of the freed slave communities in our local area. If you're interested in that, uh, we have a few up on our YouTube and our blog as well. So be sure to check those out if you're interested. Um, our question from the chat is, do you know the floor plans for any of tonight's homes or have you been inside any of them? Yeah, um, so I have, I have not been inside any of these homes. Um, and so, so for those who like, I haven't had the chance to kind of meet before or talk too much about this. So prior to COVID, I was getting into a lot of homes and I had really good momentum. Um, and every time I'd go in one home, you know, the, the homeowner would say like, oh, do you, have you been in this house before? And I'd say no. And they say, oh, I know the owner. I'll call him or her and, and tell them to let you in. Right. And they'd let me in. And so it was kind of this nice kind of game of dominoes that I was playing. Obviously when COVID hit, you know, people don't really want somebody they never met coming into their home to, to explore around. I don't blame them. Um, and so that, that side of kind of the, the things that I've been doing has certainly slowed down. So I'm kind of a little bit forced to rely on a couple of different online resources that I can use. For example, those overhead pictures from the planes, right, which are very cool. Um, me personally, I love interiors, right? So it's not quite the same. Um, and I know that for most people, I, I think what is attractive about at least what I was doing initially in this work is like you drive past, take like Rocklands, for example, everybody's been around that house and everybody thinks to themselves, I wonder what it looks like on the inside. Um, and so then to be able to actually kind of open the front door and say, go check it out, right? That's like really exciting. Um, and so that has certainly slowed down a bit as a result of COVID, but I think we are moving in a direction where that will start to take place again. Um, we did a really cool home tour back in October of 2019, where we went inside a bunch of homes and we will, we will definitely do that again. I'd like to do it again, like this October, that's maybe overly optimistic, but we'll see. Um, but no, to answer the question, I haven't been in these homes. What, what you'll see is when you look in the records, there's, there's an architectural description of the homes, right? So they'll describe kind of the layout and some of the features. Um, and then if you're really, really lucky, one of the other things I'll do is um, just do a Google search on the address. And a lot of times if the homes were for sale relatively recently, you'll get all those interior shots from real estate agents, which is always awesome. Um, but, but aside from that, I, um, it's, you know, it's just kind of, it's hit or miss whether or not you can, you can see inside. 
Well, we've certainly been lucky with how many stories and how much history you've been able to offer us even throughout the COVID pandemic. Thanks. Do we have any more questions? Either feel free to unmute or you can send them in the chat. This is Carol uh, Perlmeter. Uh, Kenny, there is a history of Barnesville and Selman that was written by Ida Lou Price and uh, Donna Lee Cut uh, Lou Cutler. And I can't remember how old it was, but um, Ida Lou Price was a postmistress for a number of years in Barnesville. Hmm. And it does detail like the oldest house, which was, I call the Morning Star house, but it's now owned by the Browns, but it was one of the original uh, log cabins that oh, was wow. in town. Yeah. And it's that lovely house that has the, the second, the porch on the front. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Down from Lib Talbert's property. Right. And the well where there's now the, the town park. Right, yeah, and yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I'll have to check that book. I know the book you're talking about. I haven't read it before. I've seen it online. Um, uh, the History of Barnesville and Selman, I, I think, is the name of it. Yeah. But it does give a lot of the the histories of the properties. Yeah, Barnesville, Barnesville's a really interesting, got a really good past with old homes. Also, like a lot of activity during the Civil War. Um, so there's, there is a lot to dig on, dig in. Yeah. On. We had the reenactment here, like in yeah. my, the seventies, I guess, I can't remember when it was. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and there's, you know, and there's the, um, a lot of work that Glenn has been doing. I know he spoke to this group, but he's been working to restore the, um, the old Barnesville Methodist church cemetery down there, which is yes. kind of across the street from, um, from St. Mary's. Correct. Um, but there's, you know, there's a, there's a, soldier that was killed in the civil war on the side of Sugarloaf Mountain buried in that cemetery. Um, pretty interesting, so. Mm -hmm. Well, these are great informative lectures. Yeah. I really enjoy them. Thanks Thank for, you, Kenny. Thanks for attending. Any more questions or comments? Well, Kenny, I'd just like to thank you so much. I hope you all enjoyed tonight's presentation and learned something new. And of course, if you think of any more questions, you can send them in the chat for us to pass along or email us later at info at org. And of course, if you follow us on Facebook, you've also seen us tag, uh, Kenny has a Facebook for historic properties of the Ag Reserve. Uh, so be sure to check that out and like his page as well.